This is a lecture for my third hour class. Well, okay. Uh, the United States gets involved in this war in 1917. What was the main reason that we went to war? Yeah, the unrestricted submarine warfare. And, uh, you know, we were talking about some famous Americans who fought. Alvin York, the most decorated soldier, Tennessee farm boy. Uh, Joseph Oklahoma, a Choctaw uh, from uh, McCurtain County, uh, did as much or maybe more than Alvin York did so far as combat was concerned. And then this man, Sergeant Henry Johnson, uh, he was, uh, the, the Army was strictly segregated in those days. Uh, but these African Americans, uh, like the Native Americans uh, and others, uh, other uh, groups in this, you know, a lot of, some German Americans, many German Americans fought, but a lot of German Americans left the United States and went back to Germany to fight for the fatherland. These were people who were born here. Uh, these aren't recent German immigrants. They're people whose families have been here a couple of generations. And by the way, they're going to do the same thing in World War II. A group of German, um, American Germans who lived here, their people have been here since the 1830s and 40s. When the war comes, they go back uh, to uh, uh, serve uh, Hitler, the fatherland, uh, Americans. That's that's hard. That's hard to believe. Of course, I don't. I can't understand why uh, young Americans would go and, uh, or young anybody's would go join ISIS, but young Americans go to and, and live in the desert, I guess, and fight with ISIS. But anyway, uh, these African Americans, as much as they were discriminated against, uh, they fought for this country. And of course, I was just doing Martin Luther King's "I Had a Dream" speech last hour. We're doing. <coughs> Head of the administration, and I made a point that Dr. Martin Luther King never gave up on America. Uh, he said America has problems, but it can be better. And I think that was the idea that these people had. They were they were mightily discriminated against in this country. They were mightily discriminated, but they loved the country enough to go put their life on the line for it. And there were several African American units that fought. Henry Johnson here happened to be in the uh, 369th Harlem Regiment. They call themselves the Harlem Hellfighters. And when he gets to Europe, the Germ he killed so many Germans that the Germans called him the Black Death, okay? Uh, when these African-American troops first got over to the war, though, they were assigned these menial tasks, uh, cleaning up camps and cooks and that sort of thing. And the French had been slugging it out with the Germans for three years by the time the Americans show up. They saw these African-American soldiers not being used in combat and... French general asked, and who's the American commander, who's the commander, overall commander of all the U.S. troops in Europe? Jack. Pershing, Black Jack Pershing, the same San Juan Hill guy, right, that commanded the Buffalo soldiers in, in 1898. Well, now it's 1918, and he's commanding all, the whole, the entire U.S. Army. Millions of men are under his command. And a French general said to him, if you're not going to use those guys in combat, I'll use them. And Pershing said this. He said, okay. He said, uh, you can use the, these black soldiers if you want to. The Pershing told this. He said, I don't think they'll make very good soldiers for you. Well, nothing could have been further from the truth. Because on the night of May 4th, 1918, Johnson and a fellow soldier were <laughs> put out between the trenches, okay, out there in no man's land. Uh, they were put out there uh, in order to... Uh, detect the Germans launching a surprise attack and they would fire their guns in the air and warn their men back in the trenches that the Germans were coming. Well, that night the Germans sent out a 30-man patrol to no man's land and their orders were to capture any Americans they found out there alive and bring them back for questioning. So these 30 German soldiers rush Henry Johnson and uh, his, his friend uh, and they are his fellow soldier and uh, they threw their hand grenades uh, until they were all gone. Then they fired their rifles until they were empty. And then they fired their pistols until their pistols were empty at these Germans. And then Henry, you know, his, his friend was wounded uh, and, col uh, and collapsed. And Henry Johnson, had, all he had left was an empty rifle. And he turns it over and he uses it almost like a baseball bat. Uh, and he beat Germans to death with that rifle butt until the rifle uh, splintered. And, uh, of course, by that time, all that he had left was a, a bow. You know what a bolo knife is? You know what a bow is? It's sharp. On, it's, a, it's a curved knife, okay? And it's razor sharp on both sides. If you slash this or you slash there, you'll cut somebody to pieces, and that's all Henry Johnson had left. And the Germans are trying to drag off his wounded buddy, and uh, Johnson just jumped on him, a gang of them, with a bolo knife, 
uh, and literally cut them to pieces. Johnson, in this, by the way, was wounded 21 times in this episode, but he saved his fellow soldiers. And the Germans ran like scared jackrabbits. In fact, only one German out of the 30 was not wounded or killed. Okay, not wounded or killed. He was not awarded the Medal of Honor. He should have been. He's not awarded the Medal of Honor. Let's see here. The Medal of Honor, oh, much later, 2015, just uh, eight years ago. I got him posthumously awarding him the Medal of Honor. But he was given uh, the greatest, uh, uh, the, the Croix de Guerre, okay? That's it, the Croix de Guerre, the French. And here they are. You see, they're, 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 they're the Harlem Hellfighters, but you see they're not wearing American helmets. Those are French helmets, okay? There's Henry Johnson. And the highest, the French equivalent to our Medal of Honor is the Croix de Guerre, which is the cross of war. And he was, uh, I mean, do I have that? Yeah, I've got that one, okay. He uh, was given the cross of war uh, and not awarded, uh, not awarded uh, uh, the, the Medal of Honor, sadly. And all 500 men, talking about a fighting regiment, the French awarded the Croix de Guerre, which is their highest military award, to 500 members of the uh, of the uh, Harlem Hellfighters, okay? Well, back home then, so the war's going on. Get this down. As soon as war was declared, the loyalty issue, write this down, the loyalty issue arose. And here's what the loyalty issue is all about. Uh, people back home are going to say, we're going to determine who's loyal and who's not. And here's what determined uh, who was loyal or who was not. And by the way, if you're not loyal, something's going to happen to you. Uh, right here, you follow up. Oh, my businesses this if I've got time I may tell you a story about that. But anyway, about German Americans that lived here. Okay. Anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, the nation was seriously divided over the war, as you know. Uh, socialist, communist, isolationist, pacifist, the Irish, the German Americans, <coughs> many of them, um, many of them uh, opposed the war. And once the war started, you know, it was this idea, we'll debate the war, and I think many people believe this today, we will debate the war, but once the shooting starts, once we commit to the war, then it is your patriotic duty to support the war. If you don't support the war, you're not a true blue, red-blooded, 100% American. And in fact, if you're not a true blue, red-blooded, 100% American, you may be working for the enemy, especially if you're Irish. Okay, the Irish hate the British. You may be working for the Germans. Uh, especially if you're a German-American. What about these German-Americans I just told you about that are going over to fight against the United States? Well, uh, guess what? You may be a, a spy right here in America if you are a German-American. If you're a pacifist, an isolationist, a communist, a socialist, you're suspect. You're suspect, okay? You're suspect. And so Congress, one of the first, you, you wouldn't you understand what I'm talking about. Yes, there's some people, you know, look, there. we have many Muslim Americans. We don't have less than 1% of the population is Muslim American, but I guarantee you when 9-11 happened, they're, they're going to be attacked just because of who they were. And the idea was anybody that practices the religion that you practice, anybody that looks like you can't ever be a real American. We're the real Americans. We were born here. You never can. And those people were attacked, okay? Many uh, Muslim Americans uh, were attacked during that time. Well, it's the same thing here. There's not a dime's worth of difference. I hope you've learned in history that the more we change, the more advanced and progressive that we think we are and sophisticated and educated, the more we change in many ways, the more we stay the same. Because let me tell you, I don't know if I've done this, but just crossed my feeble mind today. Let me tell you, because people, you know, if you're a history teacher, you go to, I don't know, a polo match, and people say, well, gee, you know, you, yeah, yeah. well, what, tell us, what's the greatest lesson of history? We missed that when we were in history class. Here's the greatest lesson of history. Uh, human nature never changes. Human nature never, ever changes. There's not a dime's worth of difference between you and 16-year-olds that were running up and down the streets of Pompeii the day before Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed them all in August of 79 AD. There's no diff, there's not a dime for it. Oh, you dress, but who cares about clothes? You listen to different music. You have a different form of transportation. You've got a phone in your pocket, but none of those things matter. So far as a basic human being, you haven't changed one bit. And if you don't think that's true, I can take you to Pompeii and I can take you to a sports stadium there. 
and I can take you around the corner and I can show you things that people your age wrote on the wall. Wrote on the wall. Some pretty obscene things. And by the way, they're no different than the garbage you read in the boys' bathroom here. I haven't changed in 2,000 years. Human nature never changes. We can't look back at the past generations and say, oh, how could they? They were evil and thank God. No, no. Human nature never changes. Well, anyway, uh, and so in 2001, we persecuted people because of who they were, because we were scared we had just been attacked. Well, guess what? In 1917, we were scared and we persecuted people. We persecuted people. And Congress immediately passed a law, by the way, which is still in effect. This has been on the news last night. Passed in 1917 called the Espionage Act. What is espionage? What is espionage? What is it? Write this down. <laughs> espionage means spying. The Espionage Act of 1917, and here it is, and it's still in effect. And by the way, it's being used to prosecute a 21-year-old American today. Have you heard about this? Well, you need to watch the news every once in a while. Let me see. I thought I had a picture. A guy had That's not him. That's not that guy right there. 21 years old. Remember the Air National Guard. He plays games with people all over the, I'm, I'm in unfamiliar territory. Video, is it video games? Is that what you play? Do any of you play video games? You don't? Thank you, and he's got team, you know. He's 20, talk about a winner. He's 21 years old and he's living in the basement at his mother's house. Playing games with people. Brilliant. Anyway, uh, he tapped, he's, he's in the Air National Guard and he tapped into some top secret documents out of the Pentagon. And now the big uproar is how in the heck did he get into the Pentagon? He's a little private or corporal. And he sent those to all his buddies. He said, how, how many people play in these game groups? I'm asking for my own information. I know nothing about them. I never will know anything about them. I've never played a game and I never will. I don't have time to waste. How many people are in there? Did you say you play these games? With how many people? Uh, 50 or 100 or 7 or how many? The people I talk to to play with it goes up to like 10. Huh? It goes up to like 10 at a time. 10 people. Okay. Well, I don't know how many this guy had, but he had several, I suppose. I'm just trying to figure out how these games work. I guess you got to have more than two people or you usually have more than two people. And uh, he gave those top secret documents away. You know, it put American agent, we've got spies all over the world, don't we? Yeah. Do, do the places where they're spying know they're spies? No. Until they find out. And now he's put all sorts of people's lives. Look at him. Look at that. Living in his mother's basement, 21 years old. I was at 21 years old. I was in Paris, France. God help us. Anyway, he's being prosecuted. He's going to go to prison. The little yo-yo. He's going to go to prison. And guess what they're going to, you know, they're not just going to say, well, you gave away secrets. they got to have a legal basis to prosecute. And guess what the legal basis is? I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, anyway, there we go. They're going to prosecute him. In the, with the 1917 Espionage Act, okay? He's spying on the United States government. So read this silently as I read it aloud. I want you to know what the Espionage Act said. It said that a person could receive a $10,000 fine. What were most factory, you know, what were most factory workers making at the time if you worked a year? What do you reckon? 300. How much? Three or four or five or six hundred dollars a year. So $10,000 was a lot of money. You could be fined ten thousand dollars, or sent and or sent to prison for twenty years for doing the following things: interfering with the draft. If uh, someone gets their draft card notice saying report to such and such a place, persuading them not to report—that's interfering with the draft. You go to prison for twenty years. 
uh, encouraging disloyalty or uttering, that's speaking, printing, writing, or publishing any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States. You can't criticize the United States government. What if they put everybody in jail today that criticized the United States government? Everybody would be in jail. Everybody would be, you know, I just paid my taxes. I wasn't speaking very pleasantly the other day after I wrote the check about the United States government. Uh, yeah, criticize the government. Uh, you could be put in prison for 20 years. Or if you criticize the Constitution, what if you said in 1917, you know what, I think women ought to vote. I think the Constitution's really fouled up because it doesn't allow women to vote. Under this, you could have gone to prison for 20 years. Or criticizing the flag, or the uniform of the Army or the Navy, or promoting or advocating the curtailment of production of anything necessary to prosecute the war. If you go on strike in front of a factory that's building tanks, you could have been put in prison for 20 years or fined ten thousand dollars or both. You understand that? Uh, of course, many Americans who were opposed to this war, and there were many Americans opposed to this war, they viewed this as an assault on what? <coughs> what? Civil liberties. What? Which civil liberties? Freedom of speech. Yes. And where do you find that? In the Bill of Rights. Where in the Bill of Rights? First the First Amendment. Get this down. Many people view this as you with me as an assault on the Bill of Rights, an assault on the Bill of Rights. And so that's passed. Get this down. The committee. I told you, when, when, a, when a crisis happens, the power of the government grows. <clears throat> that gives the government the power to, to, to put you in prison for speaking out against the war, for expressing your opinions, for speaking or writing your opinions. That gives the government the power to do that. That's expanding the government's, that's expanding the government's power. Uh, and then, get this now, the government formed a thing called the Committee for Public uh, Information. The Committee for Public Information. And it put a former muckraker, the Committee for Public Information, it put a former muckraker named George Creel, George Creel, in charge of disseminating, and they went on the radio. Well, they don't go on the radio yet, but I'm sorry about that. We don't have a radio at this point. The first radio isn't until 1919 or 1920, 21, something like that. But anyway, newspapers, uh, propaganda, get this down. And, and this is to, you know, what, what George Creel is all about is to make sure that people unite behind the war, to unite behind the war. The government's going to send out agents, and they're going to raid schools. You know, if this were 1918, I might be up here lecturing, and the, 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 there might be a knock at the door, and two well-dressed men come in, and I say, may I help you? And they'd say, go ahead with your lecture, and they just go stand at the back of the room. And when the bell rang, they would say, ladies, you may leave. They would come to you and they would say, how old are you? And if you said, well, I'm 18 years old, they would say, let's see your draft card. And if you couldn't produce a draft card, you were in trouble. You understand that? Okay. Because if you're a true blue, red-blooded, patriotic American, when you're 18, you're going to register for the draft. And if you don't, well, you may be some sort of suspicious character that's working against the war. And if there are enough of you working against the war, we may lose this war. And we're not going to to let that happen. Get this down. They raided ballparks. They raided movie theaters. And if you couldn't produce your draft card, you could go to jail. They even deported some people that couldn't produce a draft card or who spoke out or wrote things against the war. Okay? If you don't, uh, here's the bottom line. If you don't support the war, you're an un-American traitor. By the way, if this country goes to war, do you have the right to protest that war? You don't? Do you have a right? Do you have a right uh, to not support that war? Like right now? Anytime. If we go to war, do you have the right to speak out against war? To march against it? Yes. To protest against it? Yes. To sign a letter to the paper? Yes. Or, or if we go to war, do you have to support the war? 
No. Where do you go? Well, where do you go to get that? Where do you go to get? Is that just your opinion, or is there some sort of legal basis for that? Legal basis. Huh? Legal basis. Which what? Okay, based on what? The Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. The First Amendment. What does the First Amendment say? You have what? The right to freedom of speech. speech right. Freedom to petition your government if you think the government's doing something wrong. If you think sending troops to Afghanistan was a mess that was going to end in a disaster. You think the government's doing something wrong. Do you have the right to march and protest against that? According to the First Amendment? Or is, is, the first, is this just good for peacetime? Is free speech just speech you agree with? Or is free speech just what you want to hear? Is expression just what you want to hear? Is this good all times or just sometimes? All times. Well, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Does this say that? No. No. And many people said this law is an, and still on the books today. It was an assault on your civil your civil liberties. We'll get this down. New, this is a great age of intolerance. Newspapers that were against the war were shut down. Socialists were thrown out of the country. Do you have the right to be a socialist? Yes. You? Sure? If the government could outlaw socialism, could they outlaw Repu the Republican Party? Yes. The Communist Party? The Democrat Party? Yes. Socialists were deported. Get this down. The German language was no longer taught in public schools. Think about that. The German language. No longer taught in schools and the universities. That was the enemy language. And we better not hear you talking, speaking it. Get this down. German music was banned. What am I talking about? German music. What's some German music? Talking about German rap music. <laughs> what what music? It's, it's immortal. You think if you think 200, 300, 400 years from today, people are going to be sitting around listening to country and western music or rap music or rock and roll music, I think you're mistaken. But this music is immortal. What am I talking about? Absolutely. It's the great class. Who are the great and, and who wrote? The, well, I, I, I'm not trained in music, but from my limited knowledge of music. I would almost bet, oh, I don't know, $500 that most classical music was written by Germans. Makes sense to me. I listen to a little classical music. I think it's absolutely beautiful, some of it. So who are some of the Germans that, huh? Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach. Who's another one? Beethoven. Beethoven, yes. Beethoven. Uh, Mozart. Wagner, okay, couldn't play that music anymore. It was banned. In fact, the director of the Boston Symphony, Boston has a great symphony orchestra, and they, every 4th every fourth of July, every 4th of July, they play, every 4th of July, they play uh, this uh Fourth of July celebration in Boston. They play all these patriotic songs, the Boston Pops. The director of the of the uh, Boston uh, Symphony at that uh, in 1918 was about to do a concert in Boston, and he was told there were literally agents there sitting to make sure. He was told at the end of this, play the national anthem, and he refused to do it. He refused to play the national anthem, and he was arrested. For not playing the national anthem. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of this uh, Colin uh, Kaepernick. I don't keep up with professional ball. Am I pronouncing that right? Kaepernick or Kaepernick? Kaepernick. Kaepernick. What did he do? Um, to protest racial injustice in America, what did he do? He didn't stand. For he didn't stand. He took a knee in the national anthem. And some people say that really affected his. Is he still playing professional ball? I don't think so. Okay. Well, some people say that that affected his uh, prospects to be a professional quarterback. Other people say, well, he, wasn't just, he just wasn't that good. Anyway, that's not the point. His skill in football 
that he protested, okay, and was uh, condemned for that. And this and this very much reminds me of that. Uh, reminds me of that. Um, when I hear the national anthem play, I stand up and I put my hand over my heart and I take my hat off. Nothing irritates me more than see somebody inside with a hat stuck on their head. I don't, I don't know where they were raised. I don't know who, but you see that all the time. But especially when the flag, if you're even when you're outside, if the flag passes by, you ought to take your hat off and place it over your heart. Ladies, you don't have to do that, but men do. That's just the proper way of doing things, for God's sake, instead of standing there like some goober. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. But this reminds me of that. I don't care how you feel about Colin Kaepernick or what he did. This reminds me of that, okay? Uh, I will say this. I believe he had every right. Uh, if I believe in the Constitution, if I believe in the First Amendment, I believe he had every, and I may not like it, uh, but uh, I believe he had every right. Look, look, that's freedom of expression, isn't it? When I stand up and take my hat off and place my hat over my heart, uh, when I see the American flag that is very dear to me, the American flag, that's my freedom of expression. Well, if you can take away his right to get on one knee, when they play the national anthem, you can take away my right to stand there and place my hand over my heart. It's all called freedom of expression. Freedom of expression, just like speech, is not just the expression that I happen to agree with and like. It's things that I disagree with as well. Okay? That's the rule book I'm telling you about. I'm not giving you my opinion there. That's the rule book of the Constitution. Uh, well, so Congress passed this act. Um, by the way, uh, here's the limit we went to. Sauerkraut, you know what that is? boiled cabbage. When I was in school, every Thursday you could take, they had sauerkraut. I never ate in the lunchroom, but you could smell it when you pulled on the campus. They were boiling sauerkraut. I don't do that anymore. The sauerkraut's a German food. They still serve sa sauerkraut. This is the extremes we go to. They still serve sauerkraut in the uh, school lunchroom, but they changed the name of it to Liberty Cabbage. Guess what else we changed the name of it? America's national food, which, by the way, was brought here by German immigrants from Hamburg, the hamburger, okay? The hamburger had just made its debut here in America. What's the national snack food today? Is it still the hamburger? Pizza? Tacos? Yeah, yeah. And we had Germans brought this. Some guy in Hamburg these people getting on boats to go to America and other places, and you know, they may be hungry. He slaps a piece of meat between two pieces of bread and sells it. That's the, that's the short history of the hamburger. Well, now we were fighting Germany, so we couldn't be we couldn't have our good American kids eating hamburgers for God's sake. So we changed the name of the hamburger for just the war. We changed it to the Salisbury steak because in southern England there's a great plain called Salisbury. It's where the Stonehenge is Salisbury, okay, and uh, we were fighting on England's side, so to call this meat and bread Salisbury steak was okay, calling it a hamburger was not. Don't laugh at our distant ancestors because I just told you that human nature never changes. After 9-11, when, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, terrorists bombed the World Trade Center, uh, the United States wanted to fly jets to the Middle East and uh, dropped some bombs on some people that we thought might have been behind that, and France refused to let us use their airspace. But boy, that ticked us off, because we have this attitude that we saved France two times in the 20th century. If it hadn't been for us, they would be celebrating Hitler's birthday today in Paris. That's our attitude about that. And well, we didn't like that. So up in the Capitol building, the Senate and the House of Representatives, they have a cafeteria where the senators and representatives can jump in there and they can go sit down and eat. So guess what we did? We changed the name of French fries to Freedom Fries, okay? Because we were ticked off at the French. Anyway, don't laugh at our ancestors. Human nature never changes. By the way, get this now. Speaking of socialists, very quickly, there was only the only socialist uprising that ever took place in the United States. It took place during World War One, and get this now, it took place in Oklahoma. In fact, it took place very near McIntosh County, might have included McIntosh. Dewar was part of it. Conowa was part of it. Seminole was part of it. You been to any of those places? Yeah. Uh, look, our first state flag was that. 
There it is today. World War, World War One changed it to that. That's our first state flag. It was red. That is red socialism, okay? Because there was a strong, at the time Oklahoma became state, there was a strong socialist movement. There was a strong socialist movement in Oklahoma. In fact, our state motto was labor on the offensive. Labor on the offensive. You don't have to write that down, but it literally means labor conquers all things. Labor meaning what? Workers. Workers, okay? A workers movement. What is communism billed as? It's not, but what is it billed as? A workers movement. What is socialism billed as? A workers movement. What this state motto, we still have the same state motto. What it said was, workers conquer all things. Work conquers all things, okay? And the communists build, you know, when the communists take over the Soviet Union in the middle of World War I, they say it's a workers' revolution. The workers have risen up and overthrown the government, and now they promised, it never happened, but they promised that workers would control the Soviet Union. Never happened, but that's what they promised. That's what people associate with communism. Well, it's statehood, socialism today, my God, a socialist couldn't be elected street sweeper in Oklahoma. But uh, at statehood, socialism was, I've told you this many times, socialism was strong in Oklahoma. There were six members of the state legislature who were socialists. You will, you're all young and healthy. You're going to live a long, long, happy life, hopefully. And the one thing I think you will never see is a socialist le elected to the state legislature of Oklahoma. But there were six you know, when this state began. And there were socialist organizations in every county. And in presidential elections, think about this is something you're never going to see, but in presidential elections in Oklahoma, 20% of Oklahomans, 20%, that's a substantial number, voted for the for socialist candidates. Uh, the idea was the working class must rule. Socialists preach this, that Jesus was a socialist. We'll quote that in church next Sunday and see what happens. Jesus, they said, was a socialist. They said he was a carpenter. He was a working man. What did he do as a carpenter and a working man? He chased the money changers, changers, excuse me, the wealthy from the temple. Um, so who were the money changers in 1917, they said? The money changers were the Wall Street crowd, the stock market, the big bankers, the wealthy who controlled America. This is what the socialists are saying, the wealthy who controlled America. And they said because the wealthy classes controlled America, they had started this war to increase their profits. And they weren't going to fight the war. Their sons weren't going to fight the war. Whose sons were over there in those trenches being butchered? The sons of the working class. And here in Oklahoma, a group of socialists, Native Americans, African Americans, white Americans, right here in this area where you are, a group of socialists said, you know, here we are working this land. This war is a rich man's war. The rich started it. The poor are dying in it. It's a rich man's war. It's a poor man's fight. And so we have to overthrow the government. Get this now. We've got to overthrow the government and get rid of capitalism and replace it with socialism. And they appealed. All these people are sharecroppers. You know what that is? You know what a sharecropper is? Or I won't say all, but most of them, a few of them might have owned their land, but what's a sharecropper? When you work on the land, but you don't pay rent for it. Yes, and what's your rent every year? Very good. The big landowner owns 10,000 acres. Well, he says, I'm not going to farm that. What am I going to do? I'm going to divide it up in little parcels of 100 acres, and I'm going to let a family of farmers move on there, and uh, they're going to plant crops. And what's their rent going to be every year? Sharing the crop, share crop. What's their rent going to be? Are they going to pay me in money? No. What are they going to pay me with? In their houses. Anyway, I get one anywhere from one third to one half of their crop. Then by the way, they get to keep the other half and sell it. And that's how they live. That's sharecropping, okay? Sometimes it's called tenant farming, okay? Write that down. A tenant, tenant farming, a tenant is a renter, okay? So these were people who were, get this down, these young farmers, they're young men, and they are farming the land, they're working the land, but they'll never own it, okay? They're breaking their backs and they'll never own it. They're working 18 hours a day on land they'll never own. They're living in uh, insect infest, in, in, infested shacks, okay? And their families starve. 
And so in August of 1917, get this now, in August of 1917, Native American, African American, white sharecroppers rose up and they believed, and they were going to march all the way to Washington, D.C. And they believed that if they rose up here in Oklahoma, that <clears throat> uh, socialists all over the country would rise up. Thousands of socialists would rise up and overthrow the United States government. And somebody asked them, by the way, this is called, get this now, it's called the Green Corn Rebellion. It's in the, the Green Corn Rebellion. It's in August. Somebody asked them, you know, <laughs> what are you going to live on to go all to Washington, D.C.? They said, we're going to live on green corn. In other words, as we go uh, to Washington, you know, passing through farm country, we're going to steal corn out of people's pastures and eat that. We're going to live on green corn and barbecue beef. <coughs> well, the day was set for the rising to take place. But get this down, there was an informant. Uh, the law, law enforcement was suspicious that something was about to happen. And so they put an informer in the ranks of these young socialist farmers. <coughs> and of course, the person was there listening to all their plans. And as soon as he heard their plans, he would go to the sheriff and tell the sheriff. Anyway, law enforcement was ready. And on the day that the great revolt was supposed to take place, and this thing doesn't have a chance of succeeding, okay? But when they, you know, all rise up uh, to start rendezvousing at certain points so they can join together and march to Washington. The police are there and arrested. Some of them ran off into the woods. Uh, U.S. Army troops, maybe, maybe Oklahoma National Guard. I'm not quite sure. But law enforcement officials, uh, law enforcement officials, uh, uh, chased them into the woods and let some of them shot. Out. Three people were killed. 450 people were arrested. 86 of these young farmers are sent to prison from anywhere to one uh, to ten years. One to ten years. And of course, I've said to you that during World War I, the Rus Russian Revolution took place. So this scares people, uh, this farmer's revolt, uh, socialist revolt. It scares people. But during the uh, World War I, uh, about the same time this revolution is taking off, quote, revolution is taking off here in Oklahoma, the Russian Revolution is taking place. The communists, quickly here, the communists overthrow the government of Russia, and there is no more Russia and they create the Soviet Union, and that scared people. And people, listen, beginning in 1917 in World War One, they tied socialism and communism together. And I'm just going to say this because I'm out of time. They said socialism and communism is, are the same thing. They're not. I'm just going to tell you that. And by the way, I'm a bona fide capitalist. I believe capitalism, capitalism despite all of its faults, is the greatest economic system the United States, but I can tell you this, any country ever had, I think capitalism has lifted more people out of poverty than any other system, but I can tell you this, communism, don't you ever let anybody tell you, people out there in TV land, don't let anybody ever tell you that there's no difference between communism and socialism. I don't favor either system, uh, but they're two different systems, but they got tied together in the Russian Revolution. What was the color of the communists that overthrew uh, the Russian government? It was red. And so guess what? By the 1920s, we had changed our flag to that. That's an Osage warrior shield with a peace pipe and an olive branch, uh, Oklahoma. But that's what led to the change of our flag. The flag was too red. We don't want a commie socialist flag. But they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Okay. Well, uh, write this man down, and this is where we will take it up when we come back. Uh, well, just write down the name of the case. So here this Espionage Act is passed. Uh, and uh, like I say, some people say, boy, that's a great law. We're going to get rid of all these traitors here in America. But a lot of Americans said, remember, the country was pretty divided. A lot of Americans said this is an assault on our constitutional liberty. And uh, a lot of Americans challenged that. And the most famous challenge to the Espionage Act is from this man right here. And it leads to a case. If you ever go to law school, you'll deal with this. Schenck versus the United States. And remember, you always underline the names of book titles and Supreme Court cases. And when we come back, we will pick up the Schenck case after your test. Test tomorrow.
Thank you.